Brad Keithley is uh, our friend of the program here. He is a former oil and gas counsel, uh, now retired, and he is the founder of Alaskans for a Sustainable Budget, an organization dedicated to well, just that. And we're about to talk more about the special, 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 special session and what he expects to see right now. Good morning, sir. How are you? Michael, I'm doing great today. How are you? You know, can't can't complain. I can't, can't complain. Nobody listens anyway. So uh, <laughs> it's all it's all good. I mean, I've been saying that. I, you know, I, you I, 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 go, go ahead. I appreciated the insight, by the way, into into the you know what Eric's going to have for for Halloween. So I yeah. I really you know. <laughs> I've got I've got my sights targeted now. Yeah, you're headed right over to Eric's house. You know, a bowl <laughs> of stew and a cookie, and Brad's fine. It'll be all okay. Uh, uh, maybe we should be serving that to the legislature right now. Maybe that would help mellow things out a little bit down there. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, hand wringing going on, of course, over the uh, the, uh, the 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 crime bu- uh, the crime bill. But as I said yesterday, I mean, these are two important issues, but I think the preeminent issue here has got to be the budget. Everything else has got to follow the budget, and we still can't seem to find our way to a sustainable fiscal solution. No, um, and, and frankly, I think part of the reason that the crime bill is sort of playing out the way it is is nobody wants to get to the budget. Nobody really wants to dig in right. uh, to, avoiding it. <laughs> to, to, to the meat of the budget. It's, it's, I mean, the crime bill is very important, and the issues that are going on with the crime bill need to have a full vetting. But, I, but some of this strikes me as, yeah, let's talk about this some more uh, so we right. don't have to get to, uh, get to this other issue. But it's, it's out there. I mean, they're going to have to deal with it. Um, uh, we're, we're, we, we, are ha- we have PFD cuts. They've already adopted new revenue uh, uh, procedures. They've already imposed a tax on the PFD uh, in the last legislature. The Senate's tried to make it permanent. Uh, the House has tried to make it permanent in a different way. The governor's tried to make it permanent. It, it is an effort that is ongoing, and, and at some point, uh, we're going to have to get people in the room, and we're going to have to we're going to have to deal with the situation, or else we're going to string these PFD cuts uh, out forever, hurting the economy, the overall economy, while we're in their midst while while we're in the midst of a recession along the way. Yeah, well, and that's the problem. I mean, we're seeing, and again, one of the things that's really worrying to me is this discussion uh, that we keep we keep seeing these comments from Senate leadership, who heretofore have been really only willing to tax your dividend. But now there's been some kind of, I don't know, kind of flapping around about, oh, there's a 50 percent chance that this could go forward. And Pete Kelly saying, well, we could see the numbers and we really got to see the numbers. And I mean, all these other things, it's really, really troubling uh, to see that kind of language come out, because to me, it signals maybe a willingness to be flexible on this when I think that there should be no flexibility at all. There, there's another there's another uh, uh, thing that's starting uh, that, that that you see in the press, uh, there was a there was a article that James Brooks, who's the political reporter at the Juno Empire, did uh, with Angela Rodell. Uh, he did an, an interview with Angela Rodell, and then he wrote a piece on the permanent fund, and talked about the fact that last session the permanent fund took money took some money out of investments and held it essentially in cash or cash equivalents, in order to to be able to. Uh, contribute that money to the state, some of the money out of the earnings reserve to the state uh, in the event that the legislature decided to pull money out of the earnings reserve. And right. Brooks made a big – Angela made a big deal of it in the interview with Brooks. Brooks made a big deal of it. It it, it, it has uh, repeated out. There's an AP column that showed up in the Fairbanks News Miner. There was a piece on KTUU uh, about it, and, and that's another effort frankly, that people are trying to make uh, to set up the need to, to, to make permanent this grab of the PFD. They're, they're arguing that you have to put a structure in place uh, to, to routinize or to set parameters on how you're going to draw money out of the earnings reserve. The permanent fund, uh, the permanent fund chair or president, Angela Rodell, is saying that's a necessary piece. And then they're going to bootstrap from that and say, oh, and we've got to do a uh, – uh, we've got to do a – um, uh, permanent fund dividend reduction as part of as part of their overall restructuring. So you, you, that's another way that we're going to see people trying to build momentum to move into some sort of full permanent fund restructuring um, uh, next session. It, it's 
sort of it, it, it sort of had some traction going into this section this session that's when you saw Kevin Myers comment about ooh there's a 50 50 chance we're going to take up new revenue uh, but the new revenue that the governor put on the agenda was taxes the house is insisting on taxes and I think the Senate's starting to back off saying that they're going to address new revenue in this uh, in this uh, 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 special session. I think now the, the emphasis is going to be on trying to build another way to, to come at it in the next regular session. So when it's all said and done, I, I guess we should start off with, you know, what's the real numbers? Where are we really at? I mean, because is this really a crisis? And there's been a couple articles that uh, I've read and we've talked about this morning and that you've uh, sent, sent out and talked about in your pieces and one of them is the actual, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about the revenue uh, and the production in the state of Alaska. Yeah, so so every year the administration is required by statute to produce what are called uh, revenue forecasts. They produce one in the fall and one in the spring. The one in the fall is normally in December in advance of the governor's budget or in the last couple of years at the same time as the governor's budget, and that's a forecast of revenues over the next 10 years. Um, and then in the spring, they do a tweak of that to update the fall forecast for uh, uh, changes that they have, changes in price or changes that they have identified uh, through the session. And that spring forecast is sort of used as a check at the end or is intended to be used as a check at the end of the regular session to, to confirm that they're on the right track when they, when they in a normal year, uh, when, they do, when they do the budget. The right. fall forecast is, is, is the big deal and it's got, the, it's got the, the big new projections in it of where we're going. This year, because the governor called the special session to focus on revenue, the governor agreed to produce a preliminary fall revenue forecast earlier than the normal cycle that would project where we were going in the next 10 years. Um, and they've done that. That was, that was uh, released last week. And there are a couple of big surprises uh, in it. One that's been talked about a lot in the press, which is the uh, increase, slight increase, um, uh, but, but the bigger news of that is the much slower decline over time in, in crude oil production in the state. Uh, by the end of the 10-year period, in the, in, the, in the last revenue forecast last year, by the end of the 10-year period that they were forecasting then, we were down in the mid-300 uh, barrel a day level. In this new forecast, not only are we up currently, but we're on a much, much, much lower or, or, or less steep decline curve, and we're still well in the 400s um, uh, barrels a day uh, by the end of the – by 2027. So significant change in, in the forecast outlook uh, from last year to this. That, that was, frankly – it wasn't – I mean, we, we know we, – we've known that we've had continued – uh, robust production out of the slope the last couple of years, and that we knew that the the revenue forecast was really off in projecting what it was doing at least in the near term with respect to oil production. But this revenue forecast is is essentially saying what we're seeing now is going to continue uh, with new field development and with the type of activities that we're seeing on the slope, and and the the decline curve that we're going to see in the future is much less. That's a surprise to me. Right. Uh, that the state the state is recognizing that. Well, and I, I wonder at, here – go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, but at the same time – you mentioned this in the last segment. At the same time, I think they've got – I think they're still getting price wrong. Um, right. That's so, cool. so revenue is made up out of production and price. Um, it's it's – you, you know, you, our total revenue is, the, is, is a percentage of what the total revenue is from the north – from the fields – Total revenue from the field is production top price. And so as critical a, a, a factor in estimating going forward revenue as production is, uh, is price. And what they've done in this forecast, in the fall forecast, is they've lowered price uh, from the projections that they had that they were using in last year's spring forecast. Uh, they've lowered them at least in the near term. They've lowered them for the next two to three years. And that has the effect of really offsetting the increase in production, the, the projected increase in production that they're showing between the four, two forecast periods. The net effect of that is that the revenue gain that we're seeing off of this increased production, uh, at least in FY 2018, the current fiscal year and in the next fiscal year, 
is minor. It's like $35 million in the current fiscal year over the projection from last year, and it's like $40 million in FY29 and projected for FY2019. And that's due to the redu- reduction in price that they've, that they've projected. Right. And is there any backing for their sourcing on on the pricing? Because I think you and I have talked about this. They're saying that they won't see oil prices go up to $75 a barrel until 2027. And you and I have talked about this. And, and if I recall that number, uh, we're talking about oil prices in the mid, in mid, you know, $70, $75 range sometime by late 2019 or maybe 2020. And uh, th- those were some, uh, some other numbers that came out. And if that is the case, that changes the whole picture. There, there's a slide deck in the presentations they've been using with the legislature that show how they arrived at these prices. Basically, they get a bunch of people in a room in early October over at the University of Alaska Anchorage and sort of go around the table, a bunch of wise men. Um, and I mean that in a nice sense. I, others could say I mean that in a bad <laughs> sense, but I mean that in a nice sense. Um, and and go sort of go around the table and talk about where they think prices are going to go. There's an array of prices uh, that that come out of that, and they sort of you know cut down the middle and say say this is our projection. I and others have argued that we that we ought not to be doing that. Uh, that we ought to be using the expertise of the Energy Information Agency, the International Energy Administration, uh, others uh, out there that are in the, are doing this constantly, updating their models constantly, looking at world conditions constantly. We we sort of bring together a bunch of people in October. We take a single slice in time and say, where do you think this is going? Uh, and and they come up with prices and they go with that. Um, I I I don't mind. You know, making a forecast as of a given point in time, but I'd like to be using somebody who sort of does this on a continuous basis. So it's uh, it, it's the method they they use, and I think they're I think they're undershooting the price. For example, the FY 2018 price that they're projecting uh, right now that's, that's that's used in the revenue forecast is in the range of fifty five well, fifty four dollars uh, ANS West Coast. And ANS West Coast more or less tax, tracks Brent. Well, Brent has gone above sixty dollars in the last few days, um, and and surprisingly to some analysts, it stayed above sixty dollars. So there was some thought that when it got up there, it would people would take profits, it would drop back down. It's not done that, and so it's you, 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 you look at the real market, and then you look at what these projections are, and you you really have to wonder. Uh, about about the price projections that they've used. So I, I think those price projections are soft. Uh, I think they can use some modification. If you do, I think you see a higher revenue number uh, than what they projected in the uh, in the forecast. Well, and 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 again, that leads me back to the question of: Are we really in a crisis, or is this a crisis of a kind of an accounting nature, where they're they're, I mean, for lack of a better phrase, are they cooking the books? to show that it's really more doom and gloom than it should be, and again, using this as an excuse to then push both the uh, some kind of tax, income, payroll, whatever, and, of course, the restructuring and the taking of the PFD. Yeah, it's, so that depends, that depends on spending levels. Um, if you assume that we're going to continue the current spending levels, which once you take out all of the tricks, all the accounting trips, tricks are still – in the $5.5 billion range. Uh, if you assume that's where we're going to continue, uh, then oil price recovery will help, will help close that gap, but it's not going to close that gap. If you assume that we're going to bring spending levels down more toward realistic, um, uh, 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 long-range sustainable levels, sustainable from our historic revenue source revenues plus or oil revenues plus uh, the other 50 percent of the earnings as Governor Hammond uh, uh, envisioned in the 5050 plan uh, if you assume that we're going to bring spending down to that level then yeah uh, oil these this oil price recovery is uh, is significantly moving um, it's particularly if you factor in more robust prices is 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 moving the uh, moving us very closer to Getting imbalance between realistic spending levels, sustainable spending levels, um, and and the revenue levels. But if you assume that we're going to continue these current spending levels, and if you listen to the governor and the House at least, they say that you know we've cut enough, we can't cut any more, we're into the bone. 
<clears throat> if you assume that's where we're going to be, then, yeah, oil recovery is nice. It, it, it continues to help close the gap, but it's not going to close the gap fully. And, and, right. the Senate has bought, and the Senate has bought in on that to some degree. Yeah, and I'm starting to see that more and more. But one of the other things that it highlighted was some earnings from the permanent fund, and that made some significant changes. And it shows two things in my mind, Brad. It shows, one, why the Hammond 50-50 plan will work and why it's the best choice. But it also shows, two, why the legislature is so hell-bent on changing the PFD's formulation uh, to a POMV or just a fundamental change to the plan because they want to be able to get their hands on more of this money. Let's talk about it. <laughs> well, let's, let's set the baseline first. Um, the, 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 the fall forecast uh, predicts not only revenue from petroleum, but also revenue from other sources. There's non-petroleum tax revenue from existing corporate and other taxes that it predicts, and that's fairly stable over time. But it also predicts uh, it also includes a prediction for permanent fund earnings, what, what, what we expect the permanent fund to do. And, and that, in, in last year's forecast, or in the, in the spring forecast, the most recent forecast before this one, uh, they predicted for FY 2018, uh, permanent fund earnings, realized earnings, these are, these are, this is where the permanent fund is cashed out of positions and, and received uh, the, the, the gains or receives dividends or receives bond payments or, or whatever the revenue source is, realized earnings. They predicted about $3.2 billion, $3.3 billion uh, in realized earnings for the permanent fund. This revenue forecast makes a huge leap uh, and, and has reported permanent fund earnings of 4.4 billion. That's a 33 percent increase uh, from, and that's not year on year. That's just the predicted number for FY 20, 2018 from what was in the spring forecast to what was in uh, what's in the fall forecast. And that that billion dollar bump uh, in earnings really, you know, just sort of startled me when I saw it. The oil stuff. We've been talking about that for a while. I sort of anticipated that we were going to see a significant change in oil production rates because that's what we'd been experiencing. But this bump in permanent fund earnings is is startling to me. It might be – I mean, my first reaction was, well, maybe this is a one-time event because realized earnings are, are the result of, of, among other things, cashing out a position, selling stock positions that you have – and taking the earnings, realizing the earning from from that cash out. And I thought, okay, maybe this is a one-time bump, and they're just sort of cashing out of some positions earlier than they anticipated. So we're going to have a bump this year, and then the next years are going to be lower. But but the projection the projection is consistently higher. It's a billion in FY 2018, but it's still a $500 million bump in, in projected earnings over what was projected in the spring for FY 2019, FY 2020, FY 21, 2021, 22, and on out. So th there is – they are now projecting a significant change in the type of earnings stream we're, we're getting off of the permanent fund, all of which is – I mean, that's good news. Right. Um, and, uh, not quite clear yet why, why that change. But that's really good news. And if you talk about going to Hammond 50-50, which is using 50% of the earnings stream, the realized earnings stream averaged over five years um, uh, for permanent fund dividends and then 50% being available for government, you're talking about a bump as a result of this increased earnings stream over time. You're talking about a bump not only in the permanent fund dividend. Uh, which is good news, certainly. But you're talking about a bump also in the other 50% being available for government. When you go back and look at what the Senate was thinking last year when they did SB 26, what they taking the the pro projections of of the earnings stream that were that were in place at the time, uh, and and sort of running that through the the proposed change that they in, that they proposed in SB 26 to make to how the permanent fund earnings stream would become available for the dividend and for government they were going to go to a, a POMV approach which which put a cap on the earnings that you could take in any given year or set an amount for the earnings you could take in any given year and they were going to reduce the the amount of permanent fund uh, earnings that went, went for the dividend 
when you, when you go back and, and look at that, put that, use that with the numbers that were projected at the time, what they were projecting was about a 400 million plus or minus increase in government revenue from their whole change uh, in 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 the restructuring of the permanent fund in, in the restructuring of the permanent fund, 400 million right. increase to, to 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 government revenue. Do you start running these new numbers uh, from the permanent the new projected numbers from the permanent fund earnings stream? Through the through the through the existing model, through the existing dividend model, the existing earnings model, you start getting numbers that begin to begin to look like 200, 300 million dollars of additional revenue coming to government using Hammond 5050, coming to government as a result of these increased earnings. So you're beginning to get the type of bump in revenues going to government. Under Hammond 5050, under the traditional Hammond 5050, you're beginning to get the type of a bump in in revenue uh, going to government from from just these increased earnings uh, projections, that as the Senate was trying to get at, at, from going to SB 26. So if that's what the Senate was saying back in the spring was what we needed to do for government, that's the additional revenue stream that we needed to inject into government. You're sort of getting you're getting that you're getting a lot of that. Uh, as a result of the increased bump in the earnings stream that's now being projected uh, from the permanent fund corporation, that that to me undermines the case for SB 26. It says, look, we don't need to go through all that rigmarole, POMB capping the ca- capping the earnings stream, you know, reducing the amount of the PFD, cutting the PFD in half, 50 percent of that stream to 25 percent. You're going to get the same sort of thing out of just letting the the permanent fund earnings stream operate as it always has, taking into account these new numbers. I think it may. I think it's a significant change uh, in the in the way that you look at whether or not even the Senate whether whether you you look you, you look at whether or not you need to actually restructure the permanent fund. And I think it's I think it's a significant change in the debate about whether or not uh, even from the Senate's perspective you need to be cutting uh, the permanent fund dividend. So big big change in these numbers. Uh, a surprise to me, I think a surprise to most uh, analysts, not really well reported at all uh, in, uh, in the newspapers yet. Uh, you have to sort of go to my blog to dig down, in, d- dig down into it. But, but a big change, and I think a big change is sort of the fundamentals of how we should be looking at, uh, at, at uh, 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 this issue of whether or not to cut the PFD and, and, wh- and how to use the permanent fund earnings stream going forward. I think this is a big change in, in that debate. Yeah, on the conspiracy side, it shows me great. That, that's good on the 50-50 plan. But on the other side, uh, I also look, okay, so if, if we're getting that money, making SB 26 obsolete from the 50-50, if SB 26 did go into effect and these and these increases are there, <laughs> how much more money would the government take then? Yeah, it's I haven't run those numbers, but it's not insignificant. It, so SB 26 <laughs> said we, we go to a capped, we go to a POMV, uh, we reduce the dividend to 25% of the um, of the earnings stream from 50% of the earnings stream, and we cap the dividend according to SB 26 at a thousand bucks for the next three years. Uh, once you do all that, once you go through all those steps, that and you look at these new numbers, that frees up a lot of additional cash uh, right. for uh, uh, for for government. So I'm not sure. I'm, I'm a full believer in the conspiracy theory, but certainly the consequence, if you look at these new numbers, the consequence of having gone to SB 26 or going to SB 26 increases the number going to government really doesn't do a whole lot for for the average Alaskan in terms of what's go, what goes on in the dividend. Right. We're about five minutes out here, so I want to kind of get back to the special session and talk about um, the uh, the possibility of some kind of tax being passed. Like you said before, I think they're focusing on SB 54 so they can avoid the white elephant in the room. They know it's an election season. They know that any kind of discussion like this could be unpopular. But we are seeing some verbiage, like I said, from both Pete Kelly and from uh, Kevin Meyer, kind of a softening of that line in the sand, so to speak. Um, what do you think actually happens here? Well, I think so. So Kevin Myers now made new statements. He made the state. He gave an interview to Nat Hertz uh, last week in which he said, oh, I think there's a 50 50 chance uh, that uh, uh, that we uh, may see a tax. Pete Kelly uh, made the statement that, that you were talking about last week and repeated here. Uh, there's a new article 
Um, uh, James Brooks out of the Juno Empire interviewed Kevin again, and Kevin now says, oh, there's a 100% chance that the House will want to raise taxes, but in the Senate, there's a 0% chance. We see, the, we see this movement, for example, Kevin says, we see this movement in oil prices and in production rates as something significant and something that, that, that we think justifies being more cautious about moving to taxes. So Kevin's changed his tune uh, somewhat, but I, I – uh, so, so we're sort of out of – we may be out of the woods for the special session in terms of piling on additional taxes on, on top of the PFD cut. But there's no talk um, uh, either in the Senate or the House of rolling back the PFD cuts, not, not in the majority. I mean Mike Dunleavy, right. Shelley Hughes, Wilikowski, others talk about – talk about it in the Senate, and David Eastman and, and Tammy Wilson and others talk about it in the House. But in the majority of both bodies, there's no talk about rolling that back the PFD cuts. So I, I, I think they're sort, of st they're, they're sort of pocketing, thinking that they're going to pocket that money uh, and, and go into the next session, the regular session, and start talking about firming that up. That's where I think the James Brooks interview with, uh, with Angela Rodell comes in. And they're starting to build – they're trying to build a wave of saying, oh, we need to formalize uh, this restructuring to help out the permanent fund, to help out the management right. of the permanent fund, and we'll just sort of tuck the PFD cut in as part of that. So we're not, we're, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination uh, once we get to the next regular session. We're going to go right back into it again. But in terms of what's going on in this in this special session, it looks like we're getting out of the woods with respect to piling on an additional tax on top of the PFD cut. But we're not going to get the added benefit of rolling of rolling the PFD cut back. Do you think the money in the earnings reserve that they pulled out and left out so that it wouldn't earn that revenue? Do you think that that was an intentional thing? Do you think that this was kind of the Machiavellian, like you said, setting it up, or was it just kind of a unintentional, you know, fringe benefit? Oh, I think I think Angela is in a difficult position, um, and you know if the legislature turns to her and says we want a bunch of cash right now, we're not going to pull it out of the uh, out of the CBR, and we want a bunch of cash out of, from you right now. She's sitting there going, well, I'm, I'm in a I'm in a lot of stock positions. Uh, some of these are losers. If I just have patience, they'll turn into winners. But they're saying they want the cash right now, so I'm going to have to cash out of them, take losses to, to get them the cash. And I think, I think she's in a difficult position. And I think as they, as they sort of rolled up to last year's budget, they sort of kept changing in her mind. They kept changing the draw they were going to make from the earnings reserve. And so to protect herself, to have that cash available and not be in a position where she was going to have to take a bunch of losses, I think she just, you know, let a, let some cash accumulate and and didn't reinvest it. It's I don't think there I don't think there was anything Machiavellian about it, but I it, it was it was it was sort of the failure of the legislature, right. if you will, to really realize what they were doing to her, what they were right. doing to the permanent fund investment strategy. Down to the last thirty seconds, what can people do right now, Brad? They need to stay on top of their legislators, write, write notes, see them, talk to them when they see them, talk about roll back the PFD cuts, give us our full PFD. You know, we need the money. We're, we're, you know, we're talking about an economy that has increased Medicaid claims, increased uh, uh, SNAP claims, uh, uh, income adjustment or income uh, supplement claims. We yeah. need to roll back the PFD, get our economy going again, get that money back into the economy. That's what they need to be telling.